Happiness is an emotional response to an outcome. If I win, I will be happy. If I don't, I won't. It's an if-then, cause and effect, quid pro quo, standard that we cannot sustain because we immediately raise it every time we attain it. You see, happiness, happiness demands a certain outcome. It is result reliant. And I say, if happiness is what you're after, then you're gonna be let down frequently and you're gonna be unhappy much of your time. Joy though, joy is a different thing, it's something else. Joy is not a choice. It's not a response to some result. It's a constant. Joy is the feeling that we have from doing what we are fashioned to do, no matter the outcome. Now personally, as an actor, I started enjoying He's my work living, and man. literally being more happy when I stopped trying to make the daily labor a means to a certain end. For example, uh, I need this film to be a box office success. You know, I need my performance to be acknowledged. I need the respect of my peers. All those are reasonable aspirations, but the truth is, as soon as the work, the daily making of the movie, the doing of the deed became the reward in itself for me, I got more box office, more accolades and respect than I ever had before. See, joy is always in process. It's under construction. It is in constant approach, alive and well in the doing of what we're fashioned to do and enjoying it. Now, the easiest way to dissect success is through gratitude. Giving thanks for that which we do have, for what is working. Appreciating the simple things we sometimes take for granted. We give thanks for these things and that gratitude reciprocates, creating more to be thankful for. It's really simple and it works. Now I'm not saying be in denial of your failures, no. We can learn from them too, but only if we look at them constructively as a means to reveal what we are good at, what we can get better at, what we do succeed at. Our life's a verb. We try our best, we don't always do our best. And since we are the architects of our own lives, let's study the habits, the practices, the routines that we have that lead to and feed our success, our joy, our honest pain our laughter, our earned tears. Let's dissect that and give thanks for those things. And when we do that, guess what happens? We get better at them and we have more to dissect. Both of you are a huge um, advocate for gratitude and that kind of, you know, delivers your energy and how you guys interact. Uh, my question for you is like, how do you become so- Grateful? Um, so grateful, yeah, exactly. Um, to have this energy, especially from um, Tony's position, I kind of dove into your content and, and fell into uh, <laughs> your hands and your, your guidance. So, They're big ass I hands too, by the way, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> The question is, how do you create the gratitude? I'm not quite clear yeah, on Yeah, how do you, how, uh, I, go ahead. I, I, so how, how, do you become, how do you become so grateful and because of that, you live a life I, of... I, yeah. I, I think this is a, actually, this is a great first question, Brett. Thank you so much because I actually think he nailed it, which is, I actually think he's right. Gratitude, it's incredible what gratitude does. Well, two things that mess everybody up are anger and fear. When you let them dominate you, you're in trouble. And you can't be angry and grateful simultaneously. It's nope. the antidote. It's the only antidote that really works. And you can't be fearful and grateful simultaneously. So for me, the answer is question, I, I don't hope I'm gonna be grateful. I have a system like anything in life. I, you know, If you're a great pilot, you know how to fly a jet, you still have a checklist. Because if you miss the checklist, the consequences are too big. So I'm not a big meditator. Uh, my meditations have been active, it's been physical, it's been in nature, it's been ripping things open, it's being on stage. But I started a few years ago doing what I call priming. And what priming is, is most people think their thoughts are their thoughts, when really your thoughts have been primed by the environment. That's why you want to create the environments like you create and I create, because it makes you be your best. But specifically, there was a study where they took a group of actors, they had them go out to 200 people, and the only thing different, they walked up to each person, and the only different was they held a cup of coffee, they'd walk up to your stranger and go, would you hold this for a second? They'd look down so you can't say yes or no, and you'd end up taking it. they get their phone, they adjust it, they take it back and say, thank you. That's the whole thing. Same facial expression for every person. Only difference, half got an iced coffee, the other got hot coffee. Now, 30 minutes go by. 
they send out an assistant, a research assistant with a clipboard, and they come up to these same individuals and say, if you give us two minutes of your time, we'll give you $20. Will you just read these three paragraphs and tell us what you think of this character? It's a couple questions. They read the three paragraphs and they say, what do you think of the main character in this little story? 81% that were given iced coffee say the person is cold and uncaring. 80%, a 1% variance of those who are hot coffee say the person is warm and connected and caring with nothing else but coffee 30 minutes earlier, ice cold. I could tell you 50 of these. So what I do is I get up every morning and I make a radical change in my state and I have a simple deal with myself. I prime for 10 minutes every day. Because if you don't have 10 minutes, you don't have a life. There's no excuse. So I come in, I do this radical breathing change, these three sets of 30 breaths where I bring the air in and explode it out my nose because you know, I'm sure you know from Eastern philosophy, the, the breath is like the string on a kite. The mind is the kite. Yep. You can change the mind through breath. Yep. So I do this radical breathing, it takes a minute. Then I do three things for three minutes, really simple. I take three minutes and I focus on three specific individual things that I'm grateful for, but I don't think about them intellectually. I step into the moment, yep. remember it, feel yep. it, and just, and so what it does is it activates it not as yep. a thought, but as a biochemistry. Then I do three minutes of prayer and blessings, starting with my family and moving out to everybody, my clients, friends, people I meet. Yep. And then I do three minutes on what I call three to thrive, where I focus on three important outcomes that I have that I want to accomplish, but I don't think about want to accomplish it. I see it, I feel it, the experience is done, I feel grateful. I often That's go, your move. I, I actually go 15 or 20 minutes after because it feels so good, but what's happened is now you're primed. You're yep. not hoping you're in prime time, you are in prime time. And to me, that's how I do it. And once you prime yourself, you start noticing things to be grateful for all the time. And when I asked Sir John Templeton, the first billionaire investor, international investor in the whole world, started with nothing, built to that. And I asked him, I said, what's the secret to wealth? I'll never forget. He looked at me and smiled and he said, Tony, it's what you teach. And I said, well, I teach a lot of things. Which thing? And he goes, gratitude. So he goes, you and I, how many billionaires do you and I know that are miserable human beings and they're so unhappy? He said, they're poor. And if you've got a billion dollars, but you're frustrated, angry, and sad all the time, your life is frustrated, angry, and sad. How many people don't have nothing, but they're grateful for their family, or for their health, and they're there? To, so that is the game. To, really me, to me, it comes down to its cousin, which is perspective. Whoever's in last place, whoever that person is, if there was a world chart ranking, and Sally was dead last, she can talk. I don't know how to get people out of depression. I'm just trying to change people's perspective. Gratitude is my fuel. I think most people burn out because they're looking for money. I think people are depressed when they don't have things into context. They don't realize how lucky they have it. And two, they don't feel in control. When the game itself and the process and gratitude is the mix of your gasoline, you'll run forever. I've already won. D-Rock, this game's vigged. I already won. I figured myself out. I know what makes me happy. Nothing in the world makes me happier. Everybody is the happiest when they get to do what they want to be doing. When you get to do what you want to do, you've won. I think the problem is that people get to a place where they don't want to go backwards because they get fancy, right? They get accustomed to a certain lifestyle. They want certain things. When it's about getting a watch or buying a new home or getting a new pair of Yeezys, you're finished. And I will tell you the number one thing that scares the out of me. <laughs> Nice watches and Ferraris. And so I see a lot of people looking for quick highs. That is just not sustainable. Glass half empty is a terrible way to live life. This is fullest for me. I know exactly what to do with what's in there. Entitlement, you're entitled. If you ever in your life bought a $5 coffee from Starbucks, you are soft. Globally, in the 7.7 .7 billion people, you're fancy, you're soft. There's 50 million people that came from and made it. So what's your excuse? Both my parents were crackheads, and? Like, uh, I lost my job, and? These are the hardest things in life. Here's my question. Life's about alternatives. What are you gonna do about it? Nobody has anything to complain about. Unless you're the worst human on earth. In the world rankings of humans, you're 7.7 .7 billion. You live in a cage and you're a slave somewhere where nobody's looking. Because that's who that person is. Unless you're that person, stop complaining. My stuff is for the complainers who don't realize they have time to fix it. They just have to change their behavior. You can't complain about your weight if you didn't put in the work. You may be genetically disposition to not have as great of a body or be as healthy and that's just life and that's real. But I wasn't allowed to complain about my health at 37. I wasn't doing the right things. Or you can sit at home, 
play 2K and blame the world for your shortcomings. Period. They don't wanna do that. Brother, people don't wanna work. You know why? It's easier to complain. If you're happy and you don't complain, you've won. I tell my kids, you know, your last name puts a, a, a target on your back that you didn't ask for. And we don't go and create problems, but you should always be prepared for problems if they were to occur. And if they do, I just want you guys to know how to defend yourself. So the things that I have my kids doing is just have the knowledge and understanding. The worst thing is just not knowing. You know, they're growing up completely different than I grew up. Where I grew up, you had no choice but to know. You ain't know how to fight, that's your ass. Cause you're gonna get tested. There's no way around it. You're gonna get tried. You're gonna get robbed. You're gonna get your book bag taken. Somebody gonna try to take your sneaks. Like, it's the reality. It's not a false reality, that's real. So if you're not prepared for it, if you don't have any type of heart, you won't last from where I grew up. Heart was everything. And heart was sometimes saying, I don't care if I get my ass whooped. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna allow y'all to think that this can happen, so I'm gonna lose today, but tomorrow I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna find you, I'm gonna talk. Whatever that moment was, it was about establishing any level of respect that you could, and that respect eventually turned into friendship from all. So my kids don't know what that world is like, they're never gonna have it. So as a parent, I just have to make sure that you have all the tools that I can possibly equip you with. Cause my parents didn't have the ability to provide me with that. They weren't in the financial space to, to take me here and have this extracurricular activity or this extracurricular activity or learn this or learn that. It didn't exist. That is the big conundrum of successful Great people. Word. Connect, when successful people <laughs> have kids, the, what made them successful is dry. I grew up poor too. We mm -hmm. were on welfare and food stamps, mm -hmm. the whole deal when I was a little kid. And that always stuck in my head, this thought like, we might not have enough food. Mm -hmm. Like I remember thinking that mm -hmm. when I was little, like, what, what if we don't have any food? What if we mm -hmm. run out of food? My kids will never feel that. They mm -hmm. don't understand what that is. And everybody that I've ever met that's interesting came from some crazy struggle yeah. when they were young. Yeah. And that's the thing of you, you and I and most people that are doing well in life, you're raising your kids in a completely different way than literally what brought you to the dance in the first yeah. place. The hunger of not being one of those people that's left behind is what makes you successful in the first place. And it's scary. It's scary because, you know, my wife, my wife told me, she was like, you know, I love that you're not hard on your kids, but you always make sure there's a lesson within your conversation. Like, I don't yell. I don't yell at my kids. Nothing's going to register when I'm yelling. So I try my best to talk to you. Even when I'm at my angriest, I'm going to talk to you so you can process this because you need to understand what's the problem. You need to understand what's wrong. And what I had to really realize is they didn't ask to be born into this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they, it's not their fault right. that they're coming up completely different than how we were raised. Right. And we can't have anger or frustration that's dedicated and thrown towards them because they got it so much better than what we had. How do we make sure that we pass down the proper lessons so that they appreciate and understand and not take for granted right. what they have? Right. For me, it's tough because I got good kids. They're good students. They apply themselves to school. They listen. They don't do dumb shit. Yeah, they want to play video games and stay up like any other kid. Yeah. But there's no signs of of bad or, or, or crazy yeah. and the fear and panic is that you gotta know that bad and crazy exists Right. this fairy tale that we're in isn't real and at some point when I'm not around when your mother's not around when your friends or other family aren't around you may get tested with the other side that's out here that you've never seen right so I gotta prepare you for this you don't know exists. I gotta take you to Philadelphia so you can see. I try to show my kids where I grew up, thinking it's gonna be like a, oh my goodness, backfire. It's so cool, can we live here? Shut up, hey, oh, everybody Jesus get, Christ. We're talking about, get in the car, everybody get in the car right now. Everybody, we'll talk about this when we get back. Right, this, this is not going the way I was supposed to. Oh my God, it's so cool, Dad, it's so different. Wow. Oh my goodness, walked them around the neighborhood, and it's like, it's it's 
it's not a reality. Yeah. You didn't have grass? Goodness, Dad. Oh, that's crazy. Where'd you play? Wow. <laughs> like it's, when you hear, yeah. when you hear these things, it's so wow. different, man. These were your steps. The steps are broken. How did you even play? Oh my God, Dad. So wait, where where was yours? We lived on the top floor. Not the whole thing? No. It's, this is three separate units. So the top floor was me and grandmoms. The middle, that was somebody else. That was a neighbor. And downstairs was somebody else. Three different people lived in this one thing. <gasps> Together, y'all were strangers? Like they don't... <laughs> What? Hey, shut up. Everybody, it's my own answers. Everybody in the car. Get in the car. I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to say at this part. Get right in the car. Wow. But, but when you see that, that's the reality that you get hit with of, I got to make sure that I'm talking. I got to make sure that I'm constantly teaching. Yeah. If I'm not, then I'm not doing my part. I'm failing. You know, took them to the neighborhood and showed them how stores are in the neighborhood. That's where we got candy from. Here's here's where we would get little sandwiches from. Y'all walk. We don't have no stores like this. We can't walk to stuff. It's a completely different world. Wow. It's a completely different world. See people standing on the street corners. What they doing there? Uh, be, uh, they selling drugs. <laughs> that's that's tough right there. Those are people that your dad still knows. They've been there forever. That's what you don't want to do. But they're forced with these decisions just because of what they have to do. You just need to see this. Dad is taking you here to see this. Drove them all around. All around North Philadelphia. All around South Philadelphia. Made sure that they could see it. You gotta physically see. We go out the country, we go to these resorts and islands. Before we go there, we're gonna drive around so you can see what exists. Before you get to this, this is why we have to be good people. This is why we treat everybody with respect. This is why your dad likes to give. Everybody doesn't have. I'm constantly beating my kids with that information. Because mm -hmm. if you assume that everybody does, you come off like such an asshole when you're around people that don't. I began to experience some pretty sharp pain in my wisdom teeth and my jaw. Spoiler alert, it was not just toothache. My dentist took some x-rays of the jaw which showed a large mass on one side but he didn't know what it was. My health deteriorated even further. I lost feeling in the lower half of my face and I got into bed one night and I didn't get out the next day. I had never felt so sick in my whole life. In rather spectacular and dramatic fashion I started throwing up blood on my mum's carpet for maximum kind of horror movie gore style effect. The series of tests and procedures began. A diagnosis was reached. I was told that I had stage four Burkitt's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, presenting the most aggressive form of cancer in the world. I was given two to three weeks to live without treatment and not necessarily a guarantee of life either way. Believe me, I was never going to be the kid that got cancer, but it turns out that I was. And apparently the cancer was now doubling in size every 48 hours. So where do you go from there? You're 18 years old and you're told that you could die within weeks. You are told that everything you'd been promised since you were a child, the house, the family, the job, might never be yours. You're told that the next months, the laughs, the parties, the classes, the times with your friends, they will never happen because you will be in a hospital bed fighting for your life. You're told that everything that you assumed would always be yours, the things which your foundation is built upon. The times with your family, the embrace of your girlfriend, or the sunrise on your face might not be yours to feel any longer. You're told that your time is up. If not the time that was your life, then the time when you had it easy. Or when you look into the eyes of your parents and you realise that they are dying just as much as you are from this. Now you are in an arena fighting the biggest battle you will ever fight for the greatest prize that there is. Many enter that arena every day, but there is a limited number of spaces available on the other side. Not everyone will make it through. I did not pray to live. Instead, I asked that if this was going to be the thing that killed me, that I faced it with strength. If it was going to kill me, it would do it on my terms, and I would not die a coward, not wanting to let fear dictate my death any more than it had dictated my life. But no, no way, there was not a chance in hell that I was going to die of this. Along the way, I learned some pretty good lessons. Embrace each day. I was dying to get home from school. I was dying for the weekends. I was dying for the school holidays. 
And then before I knew it, I was dying in Christchurch Hospital. And I know now how important it is to make the most of it while you can. Live each day with passion and pride to your very fullest, because you are able to. Every morning that I wake up, I know that I am on borrowed time. Every day that I live is another one longer than I was supposed to, and that spurs me on. However, the most important thing that this has taught me is to take each day at a time. Taking everything day by day allows you to focus on the now and really appreciate life. And tied in with that is the ability to find the little bits of light in the darkness, because sometimes they will be all that you have left. Yes, I might have a spinal injection of chemo today, but there's something good on TV tonight. Yes, I might have my head in a sick bucket right now, but I'll never feel this sick again in my life. Yes, it's happening to me, but it's not happening to anyone I love. It's something I remind myself of each day, and it makes every day that little bit better. But the thing that people are really prone to doing is to spending time on feeling sorry for people whose situations they cannot change. And there's no point in that. What you really need to do is be grateful for the people in your life and for your ability to live that normal life. It is no excuse to not appreciate life fully. You owe it to the people that are unable to. You owe it to them to do them that service, to go out and do your best. And what a fantastic way to start each day.